This is the lecture for chapter 19, viruses. I'm not gonna cover everything in the chapter in this lecture um, because I'm gonna draw some stuff on the board for you on Monday, especially the HIV life cycle. Our virus is alive. A link below to a discussion board where you can discuss what makes something alive. It's easiest to start by comparing something like a rock to a human and then start thinking about less complex forms of life like bacteria. Can you make a definition of life that includes viruses? Can you make a definition that disincludes viruses? If you're late to the discussion, but you still want to contribute, please look up Mimi virus, spelled M-I-M-I -I virus, and summarize that for your classmates. Does this change any opinions on what counts as a living organism? The discovery of viruses was pretty difficult because viruses are too small to image using conventional microscopy, but they were detected even before micro microscope technology improved. In the late 1800s, researchers hypothesized that the tobacco mosaic disease was caused by particles smaller than bacteria. They first extracted sap from tobacco plant, plants with tobacco mosaic disease, and they passed this through a porcelain filter that they knew was small enough to track back, trap bacteria. They then, then took the flow through. There shouldn't be anything small, larger than a bacterial cell in this, um, and no bacteria either. They rubbed this flow through on filter on healthy tobacco plants, and these plants then became infected, showing that it wasn't bacteria causing this, it was something much, much smaller. We now know that the tobacco mosaic virus is a simple virus made only of nucleic acid, RNA, and proteins. Most viruses, at a minimum, have nucleic acids surrounded by a protective coat of proteins called a capsid. The proteins in the capsid are called capsomeres. In the tobacco mosaic virus's coat is very, very simple, made only of many copies of the same protein. A T4 bacteriophage is like tobacco mosaic virus in that it is only made of nucleic acid and protein. But unlike tobacco mosaic virus, its capsid is complex with a head and a tail. It uses DNA as its hereditary, not RNA. Viral coats can also have carbohydrates on them. Adenoviruses, which are human pathogens that cause things like pink eye, diarrhea, and respiratory infections, have carbohydrate chains on the capsomere proteins of their capsid. Proteins with carbohydrate groups on them are called glycoproteins. Influenza has a more complex viral structure. Influenza is the flu virus. It causes between 12,000 and 79,000 deaths per year in the US. So please get a flu shot so you don't transmit the flu to someone with a weak immune system. Some influenza strains include swine flu and bird flu. Influenza is an RNA virus with a capsid as well as a lipid membrane envelope surrounding the capsid. The lipid membrane includes glycoproteins. The RNA in influenza is also complex. It is made up of eight tiny chromosomes, each of which is surrounded by its own little teensy tiny capsid. The entire genome only codes for 11 proteins. Here's some other viruses. Rotavirus causes stomach flu. It was responsible for 215,000 deaths in 2013 worldwide. Since then, there has been a very effective campaign in the US for infants to get the vaccine against it. This seriously reduced the hospitalization rate in the US. While influenza uses single-stranded RNA as its genome, rotavirus uses double-stranded RNA. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is another single-stranded RNA protein with a fancy envelope made partially from its host cell membrane. We'll look at the HIV life cycle in class on Monday. Viral envelopes like the one shown here in herpes virus are derived from the cell membrane of the host, but they can incorporate viral glycoproteins. They mediate the interactions between a host cell and a virus. Viruses are obligate intercellular parasites, which means that they can only reproduce within a host cell and each virus has a host range, which is a limited number of types of host cells and types of species that it can infect. HIV is shown here, it can only infect humans and in humans only specific immune system cells. It's related to a chimp immunodeficiency virus, but it has evolved to thrive in humans. Here's a question for y'all, which of the following is not a property of life shared by prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, and viruses? Nucleic acids used to store hereditary information, order and complexity in arrangement of biological molecules, 
the ability to process energy through metabolic reactions, or the capacity to evolve? You can answer in the comments if you like. Typically, in a viral life cycle, the virus will enter the cell and hijack cellular machinery. The genetic material of the virus will then replicate. This could be double-stranded or single-stranded DNA, double-stranded or single-stranded RNA. Then there'll be transcription and translation of the viral proteins and assembly of the virus particles. So here in step one, a DNA virus enters a cell and loses its capsid coat. In the host cell, viral DNA is replicated using the host cell machinery, DNA polymerase, primase, etc. This encodes the viral genome as well as mRNAs, which are translated and transcribed into capsid proteins and any other proteins that would be packaged in the viral particle. The pieces of the virus, DNA and protein, self-assemble and exit the cell. Out of all viruses, phages are the best understood. They have two reproductive mechanisms, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And I have a YouTube video, a little animation that explains this if you wanna look on my YouTube site, A. Rivera Pacific. Bacteria phages in fact bacteria, they are very well understood. The lytic cycle occurs under high nutrient conditions when bacterial cell density is high. It explodes the cells. The lysogenic cycle occurs when bacterial cell density is low and or nutrients are low. In the lysogenic cycle, the virus lives inside of the cell and replicates when it replicates. In the lytic cycle, the, uh, in the, lytic cycle, the host cell will die. We call these virulent phages. So it starts out with attachment. The virus attaches to the cell and injects its DNA. This DNA encodes proteins which degrade the host DNA. The rest of the viral genome gets synthesized as well as its proteins. The phage assembles in the cell. Each phage has a head filled with DNA, an injector tail, and tail fibers that stick to a bacterial cell surface. After assembly, the phages lyse the host cell and escape into the environment. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage genome is replicated without destroying the host cell. Instead, the viral DNA molecule is incorporated into the host cell's chromosome to form a prophage. Every time the host divides, it copies the phage cell and passes the copies to its daughter cells. An environmental signal can trigger the virus genome from temperate phages to exit the bacterial chromosome and switch into the lytic mode. And here's a little diagram of this. This figure compares the lytic cycle, which includes rapid replication of viral particles inside the cell followed by cell lysis, to the lysogenic cycle, where the viral genome is incorporated into the bacterial genome to form a prophage. As the cell replicates uh, its DNA and divides, it also replicates the phage DNA and passes it down to the bacterial daughter cells. Passing down a gene through cell division is called vertical transmission transmitting a gene to another organism through infection, conjugation, or transformation is horizontal transmission. Bacterial cells have protection against viruses. These include restriction enzymes, which we're going to talk about later in the semester, as well as cellular receptor arms races, where the bacteria basically tries to hide out from the virus and the virus has to adapt to be able to find the bacteria. We often classify viruses by the type of cells they infect, the symptoms they cause, as well as physical factors like whether they have an envelope and what type of hereditary material they have. You do not know, you do not have to know this entire list, but it would be useful to know a little bit about some of these viruses, at least a couple of examples. We've got here some double-stranded DNA viruses, like adenovirus. This causes some respiratory diseases and it can also cause tumors. Single-stranded DNA viruses include parvovirus, this causes a rash. One double-stranded RNA virus is rheovirus. Um, these include rotaviruses that cause diarrhea as well as Colorado tick fever virus. Single-stranded RNA viruses where the single-stranded RNA serves as mRNA include picornaviruses, which includes rhinovirus causing the common cold. We also have some viruses that use their single-stranded RNA as a template for mRNA synthesis, like filoviruses, which include Ebola, um, or as a template for DNA synthesis. These are the retroviruses. These are the pretty exciting ones. They include um, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. 
Many animal viruses have these membranous envelopes that I already mentioned. These can have glycoproteins embedded in the envelope and they bind to specific receptor molecules on the surface of a host cell. Viral envelopes are typically formed from the host cell's plasma membrane as the viral capsids exit. An enveloped RNA virus has a more complex life cycle than the DNA virus we looked at earlier. Its envelope fuses with the host cell to give it entry. Once inside, the RNA sheds its viral coat. At this point, different pathways can be followed. In this example, the RNA genome is acting as a template for RNA synthesis, similar to regular mRNA synthesis from DNA. This produces mRNAs that code for viral proteins, as well as genomic RNA. Viral proteins get made via cytoplasmic ribosomes for the capsid proteins or in the endoplasmic reticulum for the membrane glycoproteins. The cell's own endoplasmic reticulum membrane studded with viral glycoproteins fuses with the cellular membrane. As the capsid enclosed viral RNA exits the cell, it's enveloped by this membrane. <clears throat> to answer this question, you're going to have to refer back to the chart looking at the properties of these different viruses. This is trying to figure out if you have a rhinovirus or an influenza virus. If you look at these infections, these can look pretty similar, the common cold and the flu. They have a lot of the same symptoms. So which of these different biological molecules would allow you to distinguish between the two types of virus? You can answer in the comments or you can join our discussion boards on Canvas. Where viruses came from can be kind of all over the place. We actually think that viruses have multiple origins of evolution. Candidates for the source of viral genomes include plasmids, which is circular DNA in bacteria and yeasts, as well as transposons, which are small mobile DNA segments. Other viruses have evolved from prokaryotic pathogens, for example, Mimi virus. Once viruses have evolved though, uh, you know, originated, then they can evolve rather quickly in some kinds of viruses. Here we're looking at where new strains of the flu come from. We need to get a flu shot every year to keep up with these new strains. Why is that? Well, viruses can evolve via regular mutation or they can evolve via recombination. Viruses replicate very quickly and their mutation rate is high. New mutations, some of which may be positive, are always entering their gene pool. Viruses can also evolve via viral recombination. Here, two strains of the same virus co-infect a host cell. One of them is highly pathogenic, but usually only infects uh, ducks, like birds. Um, there's also a human strain that's not as pathogenic. Here, the two strains of the same virus co-infected a host cell, and as the virus gets packaged during viral replication, some RNA from each of the strains gets packaged into each virus. This can result in a new strain of the virus, in this case, a virus that can infect humans but is also highly pathogenic. H1N1 strain of influenza, this was the 2009 one that kind of wrecked havoc and closed down some college campuses, including the college I was working at in 2009. This came about from shuffling viruses from multiple sources. So from a human version of influenza, an avian version, swine version, and then there was additional reassortment with different swine versions of influenza to make this H1N1 form. Pandemics often come about from crowded conditions. The crowds here um, in the 1918 flu pandemic allow viruses to transmit quickly and easily between individuals. In less crowded places, a person will often fall ill and stay at home in bed rather than transmit a pathogen. This keeps pathogens weaker as they must not kill off their host too quickly if they are to spread. Under crowded conditions, this is different. Now spreading is really easy and the pathogens can evolve to become more deadly. This is one fear with under vaccination. Diseases that spread more easily are under selective pressure to become more pathogenic. Interrupting transmission with things like hand washing, sterile technique, and vaccination keeps pathogens from becoming stronger. Vaccines prime your immune system before infection. This way, your adaptive immune system recognizes a pathogen and can mount a swift and strong response against it before the pathogen can spread through your system. Some diseases weaken your immune system, like measles. 
A natural measles infection leaves you more susceptible to other diseases. A vaccine against measles does not. Antibiotics are not effective against viruses. They target bacteria. They kill bacteria already living in your body. They cannot be used to prime your immune system like vaccines can. Overuse of antibiotics can select for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Evolutionary biologists have figured out some ways to keep antibiotics more effective. Viruses can make you sick with toxins. These include envelope proteins, the release of enzymes from lysosomes as cells lyse, or they can cause cells to produce toxic compounds. Vi uh, viroids shown here, this is a plant virus. These are economically important RNA viruses. They can be transmitted either horizontally or vertically. They're circular RNA molecules that infect plants and disrupt their growth. Thinking about vertical transmission of a plant virus, which of these might be true of it? For this question, you need to be able to figure out the difference between horizontal transmission of a disease and vertical transmission. If you figure out the answer, you can leave your best guess in the comments. Prions are different from viruses uh, because they're made out of our own proteins. They're slow acting, virtually indestructible, meaning you can't heat kill them infectious proteins that cause brain diseases in mammals. Prions propagate by converting normal proteins into the prion version. Scrapian sheep, mad cow disease, and creutzfeldt jakob disease, as well as koru in humans, are all caused by prions. Here you can see the degeneration of brain tissue in someone infected with a prion versus someone who's wild type. A prion can just be a misfolded protein or it can be a misfolded protein that you get from an external source, like something that you ate. For example, eating brains or spinal tissue from an infected animal. The prion version of this protein has, comes from the normal genetic sequence. So it went under transcription and translation from normal genetic sequence, normal gene sequence, but it gets misfolded at some point in its lifetime. It induces the correctly shaped proteins around it to take on this toxic folding conformation. As more and more proteins take on the prion conformation, these aggregates form, killing neuronal cells. If you want more information on the PRP protein here shown in its normal folding state and the rogue conformer state that causes uh, prion diseases, let me know and we can cover the impact of prions on humans. And we're going to cover the rest of this chapter having to do with RNA viruses in class on Monday.